My name is Charles Lee McLean. I read something in the paper that reminded me of something that happened almost 30 years ago. I was attending classes at the MVD offices at 1801 West Jefferson. And a man named Tom Birch walked up and handed me two VHS tapes. He said, this is the Arizona driver's manual on video. And one is in Spanish and one is in English. And it is. It's absolutely well put together. The state of Arizona put it together. It is good material. The cars are a couple years old, but the material is as up to date as it was the day that they, they made it. And I, hey, Tom Birch gave it to me free. I would like to give it to you free. So if you would like your copy, now ABC Driving School has put it on a DVD for you. All you have to do is call us 602-272-1908 and let us know that you want one of these. This is a complete, it's about an hour and 15 minutes long. It's a complete Arizona driver's manual on video. All you need to do is to call us at 602-272-1908 and then come by the office at 2411 West Northern and pick, pick up your copy. They'll be glad to give it to you. You call us first, it'll be waiting for you. 602-272-1908-2411 West Northern, Phoenix, Arizona. You are about to view the Arizona Video Driver Manual. The video presents all the facts you need to pass your driver's license. This video is yours to keep. Compliments of ABC Driving School. Thank you for considering us for your instructional needs. ABC Driving School, 602-272-1908. One viewing. You may have to watch it several times to remember all you will need to know to pass the test. Use the video in whatever way is best for you to learn. You may want to watch a lot of sections in a row, or you may prefer to rewind from time to time to watch a section over again. The Arizona Driver's License. Before you can drive, you must get an Arizona Driver's License. First, you'll have to apply to the Motor Vehicle Division and pay a fee. You'll need to bring proof of your age. You have six months or three tries, whichever comes first, to pass all the tests. If you are already licensed in another state, you'll have to give up your old driver's license. If you don't have your old driver's license, you'll need to bring proof that you had a good driving record in the other state. If you are learning to drive, you will need an instruction permit. To get an instruction permit, you must be at least 15 years and 7 months old. And while you are driving on an instruction permit, you need to have a licensed driver in the front seat with you. Now, on to the first topic, rules of the road. Prohibited parking. In Arizona, there are rules covering where you may park. You are not allowed to park any place where signs prohibit parking. It's also illegal to park where you may block traffic or people walking. For example, you may not park on a sidewalk or on a crosswalk, in front of a driveway or in an intersection, in a traffic lane beside a parked vehicle, on a highway, on a bridge, or in a tunnel. Since parked cars can block drivers' view of traffic, it is illegal to park within 20 feet of a crosswalk at an intersection, within 30 feet of any traffic light, stop sign, or yield sign, or within 50 feet of a railroad track. And you must also be sure your parking won't keep firefighters from doing their jobs. For example, you may not park within 15 feet of a fire hydrant, within 20 feet of the entrance to a fire station, or within 75 feet on the opposite side of the street, or within a block of where a fire truck has stopped to answer an alarm. Required Stops 
Another set of rules deals with places you must stop. Arizona law tells you both when and where you must always bring your vehicle to a complete stop. At intersections, you must come to a complete stop if you have a red light or stop sign. For a stop sign, you must come to a full stop before your front bumper goes past the sign. At a red light, you must come to a dead stop before the front bumper enters the cross street. Many intersections have crosswalks. That's the part of the road pedestrians are supposed to use to cross the street. When you stop at an intersection, you must always come to a complete stop before the crosswalk. Usually, crosswalks are marked by lines, like those shown here, but not always. Some crosswalks are located in the middle of a block. When you approach a mid-block crosswalk, such as a school crossing, you must come to a complete stop if someone is in the crosswalk. You must also come to a complete stop when approaching a school bus that has its stop arm out and stop lights flashing. You may start moving again when the bus starts moving or when the flashing lights stop. You do not have to stop for a school bus that is facing you if the roadway is divided by a barrier. A barrier can be a fence, median strip, or separation of the pavement. However, even in this situation, you should slow and be on the lookout for children running to or from the bus. At railroad crossings, you must come to a complete stop when a flashing light or other signal warns you that a train is coming. Stop whenever a train is too close for you to cross the track safely, and make sure to stop at least 15 feet before the tracks. The law requires some vehicles to stop at all railroad crossings, whether or not a train is coming. Expect school and passenger buses and vehicles carrying flammable liquids, such as gasoline, to come to a stop at all railroad crossings. Passing. There are rules whenever you pass another vehicle. Always pass on the left, unless the vehicle you're passing is making a left turn, or the road you're traveling is wide enough for two vehicles and the right-hand part of the road is clear, or you are traveling on a one-way street that is wide enough for two or more lines of moving traffic. Never pass on the right if it means driving off of the main roadway. Never pass on the left or right when you are approaching the top of a hill or a curve that limits your view of the road ahead. In those situations, you would not be able to see a vehicle coming from the other direction or stalled in your lane. Never pass when you are within 100 feet of a bridge, tunnel, or intersection. And never pass at a railroad crossing, in a school zone, or where signs or markings tell you it's a no-passing zone. It is also illegal to cross into the oncoming lane of a four-lane highway to pass another car. When you do want to pass on a two-way road, you must be sure you will have enough room to get back into your lane before meeting any oncoming traffic. Arizona law requires that you return to your lane before coming within 100 feet of any oncoming vehicle. Right of way. When the paths of two or more vehicles will cross, there are rules that specify which vehicles must yield the right of way. You must be prepared to yield the right of way whenever you enter traffic. If you enter the path of a car in a way that forces the driver to change speed or direction to avoid hitting you, you could be cited for failure to yield the right of way. If there is an accident, it will be your fault. This is a yield sign. It doesn't automatically require you to come to a complete stop, but you must be ready to stop if the traffic lane you want to enter is so busy that you can't get in without forcing their car to change its speed or direction in order to avoid a crash. Most intersections have signs or traffic lights to show which car must yield the right of way. But some intersections have no stop signals or yield signs. In these cases, you must yield the right of way to the car that arrives at the intersection first. This same rule 
yielding to the car that gets there first, also applies to intersections where every car has a stop sign. If there are no signs or lights, or there is a four-way stop, and you get to the intersection at the same time as another driver, use these rules to figure out who must yield the right-of-way. Generally, the car on the left must yield the right-of-way. If the other car is on your left, you go first. If you are on the left of the other car, the other car goes first. If you will be turning left at an intersection, you also have to yield the right-of-way to drivers approaching the intersection from the other direction. When your road comes to an end at the intersection, yield the right-of-way to drivers going through the intersection. When you come to a stop sign, stay stopped until cars that are in or close to the intersection have all passed. Be extra careful before crossing a divided highway. Remember to check both directions for approaching cars, not just the roadway on the near side. Special right-of-way rules apply to emergency vehicles and pedestrians. You must yield the right-of-way to emergency vehicles such as police cars, fire trucks, and ambulances. When these vehicles approach from any direction, you must pull as far to the right as you can and come to a stop. You must stay stopped until the emergency vehicle has passed. You must yield the right-of-way to pedestrians walking across the street at crosswalks. Remember, there really are crosswalks at every intersection, whether or not they are marked. When you are driving out of a driveway, alley, or building, stop before you reach the sidewalk. You must give the right-of-way to pedestrians. Stop again before reaching the street. You must give the right-of-way to vehicles in the street. And you must always yield the right-of-way to legally blind pedestrians, wherever they are walking. Legally blind pedestrians usually carry a white-tipped or metallic cane. Sometimes they are assisted by a sighted person or by a guide dog. The most important thing to remember about right-of-way is this. Even when you have the right-of-way, you must yield it to other vehicles when it is necessary to prevent an accident. If you don't do everything you can to avoid an accident, you can be found at fault, even if the other driver was supposed to yield. Signal lights. Let's review traffic signals and what they mean. A red light means stop. And stay stopped until a green light comes on and the crosswalks and intersection are clear. At most intersections, you are allowed to make a right turn at a red light after first coming to a complete stop. Before turning, you must yield to all pedestrians and to all intersecting traffic. A sign like this means you are not allowed to turn right on a red light. You may also make a left at a red light if you will turn from a one-way street into another one-way street. Again you must come to a complete stop and yield to pedestrians and traffic. A flashing red light means come to a complete stop and proceed only when it is safe. Follow all right-of-way rules. A green light means go. If you are waiting at the intersection when the light turns green, you must make sure all vehicles and pedestrians are through the intersection before you may go. Before going through a green light, check to make sure no vehicles which could cross your path are entering the intersection. Remember, a green light is not a guarantee of safety. It won't protect you from someone who runs a red light. A yellow light warns you that the signal will soon turn red and you should be ready to stop. If you can stop before reaching the intersection, you should do so. Remember, if you decide to beat the light and it turns red before you enter the intersection, you could get a ticket. A flashing yellow light means proceed with caution. You may go through the intersection without stopping, but you must slow down to watch for other vehicles which may also be entering the intersection. A colored arrow means the same thing as a colored light, but only for the direction it is pointing. In other words, a green arrow means you may go, but only in the direction shown by the arrow. 
A yellow arrow means you can still go in the direction the arrow is pointing, but you must proceed with caution because you are about to lose the right of way. Traffic signs. There are many types of traffic signs. You must know what each one means. Often the shape of the sign alone tells what kind of information is written on the sign. For example, signs this shape always mean stop. This shape always tells you that when entering or crossing a roadway, you must yield the right of way to vehicles on that road. This shape tells you that you are coming to a school crossing and should approach it with caution. Round signs warn that you are coming to a railroad crossing. X-shaped signs are posted right at the railroad crossing. This diamond shape warns of a hazard ahead or nearby. Rectangular signs contain a variety of information. They may tell you the number of miles to the next town, regulations such as the speed limit, or show the proper traffic lanes for turns. This pennant-shaped sign is found on the left side of a two-way road. It tells you that you are in a no-passing zone. Sometimes the shape of the sign alone is... This video is yours to keep. Compliments of ABC Driving School. Thank you for considering us for your instructional needs. ABC Driving School, 602-272-1900. A bridge or obstruction ahead is pretty low, limiting your overhead clearance. This sign says there is only 11 feet and 9 inches from the ground to the underside of the bridge. The road ahead gets slippery when wet. A steep or long hill is ahead. The road will become a divided highway. The divided highway will no longer be divided ahead you will have to move to the right to go around an obstruction. The road will change to a two-way street with traffic coming from the opposite direction. The road ahead will narrow from the right. If you are in the right lane, you will have to merge left. Another road merges onto your road from the right. The following signs show sharp turns or curves in the road ahead. The road turns sharply to the right. The road turns sharply right, then left. There is an S-curve ahead. Often a sign will have a picture of an animal or some type of vehicle on it. The animal or vehicle may be crossing the roadway. Examples are deer crossing, horse and rider crossing, bicycle crossing, pedestrian crossing, school crossing. This sign warns you that you are approaching a railroad crossing. This sign marks the spot where railroad tracks cross the road. Not all traffic signs are on the road. This one is found on the back of slow-moving vehicles, such as tractors or construction equipment. When approaching a vehicle with this sign on it, you must be careful because it moves very slowly. Speed limit signs show the maximum miles per hour allowed. These signs may be by themselves or combined with warning signs. Highway on and off ramps often have combination speed and warning signs. Signs that have this red circle and diagonal stripe tell you things you may not do. No left turn. No right turn. No U-turn. No parking. Some signs talk about the movement of traffic. For example, this sign tells you that vehicles in the left lane may either go straight or turn right, but vehicles in the right lane must turn right. This sign says traffic in both lanes must turn right. This sign hangs over lanes that are set aside for vehicles making a left turn from either direction. This is a one-way sign. Cars on the street can travel only in the direction shown by the arrow. This red rectangular sign means you are going the wrong way on a one-way street or freeway ramp. This square sign with a red circle in it is a do-not-enter sign. 
you may not drive into any street, parking lot, or freeway ramp that has this sign at the entrance. This sign marks parking spaces reserved for handicapped drivers. Do not park here unless you are handicapped and have a license plate or permit that proves it. Roadway markings. Sometimes information for drivers is painted on the road. You must be able to understand what these markings are saying. A yellow line on the roadway separates lanes that travel in opposite directions. A white line separates lanes that travel in the same direction. A solid line on your side of the road means it is illegal and unsafe to pass. A dashed line on your side of the road means you may pass, but only if it is safe to do so. When there are two solid yellow lines between lanes of two-way traffic, then neither you nor people coming in the other direction may pass. Diamond shapes painted on the road tell you that there are special rules about who may use the lane or when it may be used. These rules usually appear on a sign along the side of the road. If you can't tell for sure who's allowed to use the lane, it's best to stay out of it. Lane markings like this show that you are in a two-way left turn lane. This lane is used by vehicles making a left turn from either direction. Parking. Whenever you park, it is your duty to make sure the car will not move. Make sure your transmission is in park and your parking brake is set. If your car has a manual transmission, put it in first gear. When you park on a hill, you also should use your tires to help your vehicle stay put. When you park next to a curb with the car facing uphill, turn your front wheels toward the street. This way, if your car starts to roll back downhill, the curb will help hold it in place once the front tire makes contact. When you park facing uphill and there is no curb, turn your wheels toward the side of the road. This way, if your car begins to roll, it won't roll into the street. When you park facing downhill, turn your wheels away from the road. If there is a curb, it will help hold your car. If there is no curb, at least your car won't roll into the road. Safe driving practices. The first section dealt with rules that have been made up to help keep people out of one another's way. There are also rules that no one made up. They result from the laws of nature. One of these laws involves speed. The faster you go, the longer it takes to stop and the harder it is to turn. This leads to rules about how fast you can go. Out on the interstates where there is plenty of room to stop or turn, the speed limit is generally 65 miles an hour. On other highways where there isn't quite so much room, it's 55 miles an hour. In business or residential areas where you may have to stop quickly, it's 25 miles an hour. And in school zones where you may have to stop real fast, it's 15 miles an hour. Those are the general speed limits. Lower speeds may be set in certain... Thank you for participating with ABC Driving School. You're certainly welcome to this video. Thank you for considering us. 602-272-1908. You, you should drive in the right lane. How fast you can safely drive depends on a lot of things. One of these is traffic conditions. The more traffic there is, the less time you have to stop and turn. Therefore, slow down below the posted speed limit whenever motor vehicles, bicycles, or pedestrians make it unsafe to travel at the posted limit. How well you can see what's coming is another thing that affects how fast you can drive. Slow down below the posted speed limit whenever you approach an intersection, approach a curve, approach the top of a hill, 
or travel on a narrow or winding roadway. It's also hard to know what's coming when darkness or weather conditions limit how far and how clearly you can see. When driving at night, be sure to drive slowly enough that you can stop within the distance lighted by your headlamps. If your headlights shine only 100 feet ahead, but it takes 200 feet to stop. ABC Driving School, 602-272-1908. 2411-2411, West Northern, Phoenix, Arizona. 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000. If you get to the object before you finish saying 4, 1,000, you are going too fast. It takes much longer to stop on a slippery surface than on dry pavement. Therefore, you need to drive slower than the limit whenever the road is wet. You need to slow way down when the road is covered by ice or packed snow, particularly going downhill. On wet roads, your tires can actually lose contact with the road surface and ride on top of water if you drive too fast. This is called hydroplaning. The only way to avoid it is to keep your speed down. If you think your tires have lost contact with the surface of the road, you should maintain a steady speed and keep moving in a straight line. Slowly ease your foot off the gas pedal. Keep the steering wheel straight. If you must turn, do it slowly and no more than necessary. If you must use your brakes, apply them gently. If you start to skid, release the brakes and apply them gently again. Don't try to stop or turn until your tires are gripping the road again. When you drive down a long, steep hill, say you're on a mountain, canyon, or valley road, Keep your car in gear so you won't build up too much speed. Use the same gear going down the hill as you would if you were climbing the same hill. Never put the car in neutral or push in the clutch so you can coast. You may never get back into gear again. At times, driving conditions get so bad you must stop driving entirely. For example, Heavy rain, snow, fog, or dust storms may make it impossible to see well enough to keep driving. In these conditions, you should immediately slow down. Carefully pull off the road and onto the shoulder. Get as far off the road as you safely can. Use your emergency flashers. Don't just leave your lights on. Many accidents have happened because drivers try to follow the lights of a parked car. Maintaining a cushion of space. Another law of nature involves space. The more space there is between you and another car, the more time you have to stop or turn. The space in front of your vehicle is the easiest to control. The best way to keep space in front is to keep from following the car ahead too closely. Stay at least two seconds behind the vehicle ahead. Here's how to figure out if you are two seconds behind. Find a marker up ahead, a sign or something that is not moving. When the vehicle ahead passes the marker, start counting 1,000, 1,000. If you reach the marker before you finish saying 1,000, then you are less than two seconds behind. Drop back and try counting again. If you have a two-second following distance and someone pulls in front of you, drop back to make a new two-second following distance. Two seconds is usually a safe following distance under normal conditions. Sometimes you will need a larger following distance. For example, when driving on slippery roads, when carrying or towing heavy loads, when following motorcycles, when the driver behind wants to pass you, when following drivers who cannot see directly behind them, when large vehicles ahead block your view. A special following distance law applies to fire trucks. You must stay at least 500 feet in back of them when they are responding to an alarm. Keeping space open to the sides of your car is just as important as keeping space ahead. It's a little harder to keep space to the sides, though. 
Here are some ways to keep those side cushions in place. Speed up or slow down to avoid driving alongside other vehicles. If someone is passing you on a two-way road with only one lane in each direction, slow down if possible. Give the driver room to pull in ahead of you. This is courteous and a good way to protect your cushion of space up front. Never speed up when being passed. Keep away from oncoming cars. When conditions allow it, drive in the right lane, far away from oncoming traffic. When possible, change lanes to let other vehicles enter a freeway more safely. Watch for other vehicles at freeway exits. Some drivers may swerve at the last minute to get off at an exit, or some drivers may swerve from an exit lane back onto the highway. Be careful near parked cars. Pedestrians may dart out from between them. Doors may open suddenly, or a car may suddenly pull out. When there are hazards on both sides of a road, try to split the difference by steering midway between each hazard. If one hazard is more dangerous than the other, give the bigger danger more room. Sometimes you can separate hazards by changing speeds. This lets you take them one at a time. For example, with a pedestrian to the right and an oncoming car to the left, you can slow down and move right. Then, when the car passes, swing to the left to give the pedestrian a wide berth. The space behind your car is more easily controlled by the driver behind than by you. But there are ways you can help that driver keep a safe distance. For example, keep a steady speed and signal in advance when you want to slow down. If another car is tailgating, it is following too closely. In this case, move over to the right lane, if there is one, and let the car pass. If there is no right lane, wait until the way ahead is clear, then flash your brake lights and gradually slow down to encourage the tailgater to drive around you. And try to avoid cutting into the following distance of a driver behind you. For instance, avoid sudden stops or backing up in the road. Never park or stop on a highway unless it's an emergency. And never back up on a highway. If you miss an exit, go on to the next exit, get off the highway, and come back to the exit you missed. Many people have a hard time managing the space around them when they enter or exit freeways. Here are a few tips that will help you get on and off freeways safely. When entering freeways, use the entrance ramp to accelerate to the speed of traffic on the freeway. While on the ramp, start checking for a gap in traffic on the freeway, but don't take your eyes off the ramp ahead for long. Someone may be slowing or stopping in front of you. Activate your turn signal. When you're alongside the freeway and ready to merge, use your side view mirrors and glance over your shoulder to make sure you have enough room to enter the freeway safely. If you can't get onto the freeway, stay on the ramp, but signal to other drivers what you plan to do. When you're getting ready to exit the freeway, make sure you get into the proper lane in plenty of time so that you don't have to change lanes in a hurry to get to the exit ramp. Signal your intention to leave the freeway at least a half mile before the exit ramp. Don't start slowing down until you get off the main road and into the deceleration lane. Never back up on an entrance or exit ramp. Never stop on a ramp unless it's an emergency. Lane selection. One way of keeping lots of space in front and to the sides is by driving in the correct lane. When there is only one lane in each direction, drive in the right lane and use the oncoming lane for passing only. Always be very careful when using the oncoming lane for passing. When there are two lanes in your direction, you should keep in the right lane most of the time. Use the left lane only for passing or making left turns. When there are three or more lanes in one direction, you should use the right lane when driving more slowly than other traffic and when making right turns. Use the center lane or lanes for normal driving. 
Use the left lane for left turns and passing. The shoulder of roads or freeways is not a traffic lane. Never drive on the shoulder. It's for emergencies only. Someone pulling off the road for an emergency won't look to see if a car is driving there. Remember the markings for a two-way left turn lane? Never go into this kind of lane unless you are about to make a left turn. It is illegal to use these lanes for passing or for entering traffic. When turning from a street or onto a street where there is more than one lane in your direction, use this rule. Start from the lane nearest to where you are going and enter the lane that's nearest to where you came from. In other words, if you're planning to turn left, start from the left lane and turn into the leftmost lane in your direction. If you're turning right, start from the right lane and turn into the rightmost lane. When turning left, don't cut the turn short and drive into the oncoming lane. Before you turn, look for signs and pavement markings that tell you which lane turns where. Communication. Another law of nature is that other drivers are better able to stay out of your way when... Thank you for participating with ABC Driving School, 602-272-1908-2411, West Northern Phoenix, Arizona. Where you are and what you plan to do. Other drivers expect you to keep doing what you're doing. Warn them when you're about to do something different, whenever you're going to change speed or direction. This will give them time to react. Turn signals are a great way to communicate. Always signal before changing lanes, turning at an intersection, entering or leaving a freeway, pulling away from the curb, pulling over to the side of the road. If you don't signal, other drivers won't know your plans. This could result in an accident. Here are some important rules about signaling direction changes. Get into the habit of signaling every time you change direction. Signal even when you don't see anyone else around. It's the car you don't see that is most likely to hit you. In heavy traffic, use signal lights and hand signals. A hand signal may be seen by drivers who for some reason cannot see your lights. This hand signal means you are about to turn left. This hand signal means you are about to turn right. Signal as early as you can. Signal at least three or four seconds before you make your move. If you are planning to turn at an intersection, start signaling about a half a block away. If you plan to turn just beyond an intersection, do not signal until you are actually at the intersection. If you signal earlier, another driver may think you're turning at the intersection and might pull into your path. On very gradual turns, your car's turn signals may not turn themselves off. After making a gradual turn or lane change, be sure your turn signal is off. Turn it off if it hasn't turned off by itself. If you don't, other drivers might think you're going to turn and pull into your path. In addition to communicating your plans to change direction, you must also communicate your intention to slow down or make an unexpected stop. If you are going to stop or slow down where another driver would not expect it, tap your brake pedal three or four times quickly or give this hand signal. Use these signals before slowing down for something ahead that the driver behind you may not be able to see. Before slowing to turn off a highway which has no slowdown lane. Before slowing to park or to turn into a driveway. This is especially important when turning just before an intersection. Drivers behind you are likely to expect your turn signal to mean you will turn at the intersection. In addition to letting people know what you are going to do, you must let them know where you are. One way to make sure drivers know where you are is to avoid driving in their blind spots. Every vehicle has blind spots on either side. The blind spots are located in the areas too far forward to see in your mirrors 
and too far back to see out of the corners of your eyes. It's hard for other drivers to see your car if you are hiding in one of their blind spots. If you are in someone's blind spot, speed up or... ABC Driving School. Welcome to ABC Driving School. 602-272-1908. On rainy, snowy, or foggy days, it's often very hard for others to see your car. On gray days, cars seem to blend into the surroundings. In these conditions, headlights make your car easier to see. Turn on your headlights when it first begins to get dark. And be sure to use the correct lights. If you're moving, the correct lights are your headlights. Parking lights are for parked cars only. The easiest rule is to turn on your headlights whenever you are having trouble seeing other cars. If you're having trouble seeing them, chances are the other cars are having trouble seeing you. Just because someone can see you doesn't mean that they will. People cannot see you unless they are looking your way. Your horn can get their attention. Use it whenever it may help prevent an accident. If there is no clear danger, a light tap on the horn should be all you need. <coughs> Give your horn a light tap as you near someone riding a bike or when you see someone walking close to the roadway. As you start to pass a driver who may be considering passing the car in front of him. When approaching a driver who does not seem to be paying attention, or who may be having trouble seeing you. Or when coming to a place where you cannot see what is ahead, such as at a blind turn, steep hill, or sharp curve. If there is a real danger, don't be afraid to sound a sharp blast on your horn. For example, use your horn loudly when a child is about to run into the street, when another car is in danger of hitting you, or when you have lost control of your car. If your car breaks down on or near the highway, be sure that other drivers can see your car. Many accidents occur because a driver fails to see a stopped car. If you are having car trouble and must stop, follow these rules. If possible, pull off the road, all the way out of the traffic. Turn on your emergency flashers to show you are not moving. If your car doesn't have flashers, use your turn signals instead. At night, turn on your inside lights. Lift the hood and tie a white cloth to the antenna or door handle to signal an emergency. If you can't get completely off the road, stop where people have a clear view of your car from behind. Do not stop just over a hill or just around a curve. Give other drivers plenty of warning. Carry emergency flares and set them out 200 or 300 feet behind your car. This gives other drivers enough room to change lanes. If you don't have emergency flares, stand by the side of the road, not in the road, and wave the traffic around. Use a white cloth or flag if you have one, but be sure not to stand in the road. Seeing. One more law of nature is that you can't see what you're not looking at. Most of what you do in driving is based on what you see. Therefore, in order to be a good driver, you need to be looking in the right place at the right time. One rule of seeing well is keep your eyes on the road. Don't let yourself get distracted. If you want to look at a road map or find a cassette tape in the glove compartment or look for something you've dropped, don't do it while you're driving. Wait until you've stopped. Don't try to change clothes, put on a safety belt, or discipline children while you're driving. If you must do these things, pull over to do it. Don't be distracted by things outside the car either. When you pass an accident or a local attraction, keep your eyes on the road where they belong. Too many drivers look only at what's happening right in front of their car. If you do this, you won't see what's happening further ahead that could affect you. In that case, you won't have enough time to react to an emergency. How far ahead should you look when you're driving? At least 12 seconds ahead. In the city, 12 seconds is about one block. On the highway, it's about a quarter mile. 
you can tell if you're looking 12 seconds ahead the same way you can tell if you've got two seconds following distance. Find a non-moving object or shadow near the road about as far ahead as you're looking. Start counting. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000, 6, 1,000, 7, 1,000, 8, 1,000, 9, 1,000, 10, 1,000, 11, 1,000, 12, 1,000. If you get to the object before you can say 12, 1,000, you're not looking far enough ahead. Look to both sides of the road ahead for possible hazards. If someone is about to step into your path, or if a car happens to drive through a stop sign and enter your path from a side street, you will be better able to do something about it if you're looking for it. At railroad crossings, slow down and look for approaching trains, even when warning lights are not flashing. Warning lights don't always work. If lights are flashing, or if you can see a train, you should stop. Don't take any chances. You might misjudge how fast the train is coming. Don't be lulled into a false sense of security because you've never seen a train at a particular crossing. Most drivers killed at a railroad crossing had never seen one there either. It's also important to see to the sides whenever you want to change direction. Always check behind you and to the sides to make sure you do not cut off other cars. Check behind and to the sides whenever you change from one lane to another, enter a freeway or highway from an entrance lane, or enter the roadway from the curb or shoulder. Here are some important things to remember when changing lanes. Glance into your rear view and side view mirrors. Make sure no one is about to pass you. Glance over your left or right shoulder. Be sure no one is driving in your blind spots. When you check over your shoulder, check quickly. Do not take your eyes off the road ahead for more than an instant. The car ahead of you could stop suddenly while you're checking over your shoulder. Check the lanes on the other side of the lane you intend to move into. Someone in another lane may be planning to move into the same spot you want. And don't forget to keep an eye on things happening behind you. During regular driving, check your rear view mirror occasionally to find out what's behind you. If an emergency came up, you might not have time to look then. Always be sure to check behind you when you get ready to slow down for a turn, exit ramp, or stoplight. This is the best way to protect yourself from rear end collisions from drivers who are not paying attention. And always take a good look behind you when you are backing up. It's not enough to look in your mirrors. To see everything that's behind you, you have to turn around and look over your right shoulder. To see everything you need to see, you must make sure your car is set to give you a clear view. Before you drive, adjust your seat and mirrors. Wear glasses if necessary. Keep windows and mirrors clean. Bright sun or headlights cause glare on a dirty windshield and make it hard to see. Carry a rag and window cleaner so you can clean your windshield whenever it needs it. Don't drive when cargo or passengers in your car block your view of any area around your car. Turn on your headlights whenever it begins to get dark or when weather conditions make it harder to see. Use your high beams whenever possible during night driving. High beams let you see further down the road. And since you can see further down the road, you can drive a little faster than with low beams and still be able to stop in time for something blocking the road ahead. Just as you need to see well, so do other drivers. Don't blind them with your headlights. Dim your high beams whenever you meet an oncoming vehicle or when you approach another vehicle from behind. The law requires you to dim your lights when you are within 500 feet of another vehicle. You should also dim your high beams when driving in fog, snow, or heavy rain. Under these conditions, high beams reflect back at you, making it actually harder to see because of the glare. So use only low beams in fog, snow, or heavy rain. If you meet a car with its high beams on, flash your high beams on and off once. This will signal the other driver to dim his lights. 
If the other driver still doesn't switch to low beams, do not put your high beams on just to get even. This will only make things worse. Blinding the other driver leaves two people unable to see where the traffic is. Driving Emergencies The last section dealt with rules for safe driving, for handling speed and space, for making sure others see you, and making sure you see others. If you do these things well, you will seldom get into trouble. However, even the safest drivers can find themselves in a tight spot. Handling these emergency situations is what the next section is all about. Once in a while, through inattention, the right wheels will drop off the pavement. Or, to avoid a collision, it may be necessary to drive completely off the road. When this happens, the thing to do is steer straight ahead. Do not apply the brakes. Ease off the gas and slow down gradually. Stay off the road as long as you can and slow down as much as possible. It is easier to turn back onto the road at lower speeds. When you turn back onto the road, turn the wheel sharply back onto the pavement. Be prepared to turn the wheel sharply back in the other direction as soon as both right tires are on the pavement. If you don't, you're likely to find yourself in the oncoming lane before you know it. Skid recovery. The best way to handle a skid is not to get into one. However, if you suddenly feel the rear of the car begin to slide sideways, here's what to do. Stay off the brake. If you apply the brakes when skidding, your wheels may lock, making the skid worse. Turn the steering wheel quickly in the direction you had intended to go. You'll probably do this naturally. That is, if the rear of your car is swinging to the right, turn the steering wheel to the right. If the rear of the car is swinging to the left, turn the wheel to the left. As the car begins to straighten out, turn the wheel back the other way to prevent overshoot. Keep the wheels pointed in the direction you want them to go. Avoiding collisions. This happens to almost everyone if they drive long enough. When drivers think they are about to crash, most just hit the brakes as hard as they can. Often this locks the wheels and puts the car into a skid, making things worse. Braking may be the right thing to do, but it is not the only thing to do. To avoid a crash, you can do three things. You can stop quickly, you can turn quickly, you can speed up quickly. To stop the car quickly in an emergency, you hit the brake with an on and off pumping action. Here's the way to do it. Push the brake pedal hard. When the car starts to skid, quickly let up on the brake, then quickly push it down again. Use this quick pumping action until the car is stopped. Pumping the brakes is generally the best way to stop in an emergency or when driving on a slippery surface. The car will stop more quickly and you can continue to steer. If you won't be able to stop in time to keep from hitting something, steer away from it. Drive off the road if necessary. It's still better than hitting another car. If you can, stay off the brakes while you turn. This lessens the chance of a skid, especially if you're turning onto a soft shoulder. To turn as quickly as possible, you must follow these steps. Always drive with your hands on opposite sides of the steering wheel. This position lets you turn the wheel the greatest distance in the shortest time. To avoid something, turn the wheel halfway around in the direction you want to go. As you pass the obstacle, turn the wheel all the way around in the other direction to get back into your lane. As you return to your lane, turn to straighten the wheel. Remember, once you have turned away from something, you must be ready to turn back again quickly. Many people steer away from one crash only to end up in another. Sometimes you have to speed up to avoid a crash. This may happen when another car is about to hit you from the side or from behind. In a car with a manual transmission, shift quickly into a lower gear and push the gas pedal to the floor. If the car has an automatic transmission, just push the gas pedal to the floor. 
Head-on collisions. This is the kind of emergency you will probably never face. But if you do, you'll have to react quickly. First, honk your horn. If the driver has drifted into your lane because he's dozing, distracted, or drunk, his first reaction would be to swerve back into his own lane. Second, pull to the right as far as you can. Even if you get hit, it will be a glancing blow. Anything is better than a head-on collision. Car emergencies. One emergency that can be very dangerous is a tire blowout. The way tires are made these days, blowouts are not very common. But if a tire does blow out, here's what to do. Hold the steering wheel tightly and keep the car going straight. Slow down gradually. Take your foot off the gas pedal slowly. Do not apply the brakes. If you do, the car may begin to skid. Let the car slow to a stop, pulling off the road just before it comes to a stop. Apply the brakes only when the car is almost stopped. Brakes seldom stop working all of a sudden. If they do, it's usually because you are low on brake fluid. If this happens, pump the brake fast and hard several times. Sometimes this will build up enough brake pressure to stop the car. If that doesn't work, apply the parking brake slowly. But hold the brake release button or lever so you can let off the brake if the rear wheels lock and you begin to skid. If that doesn't work, shift to low gear. Look for a place where you can slow to a stop. Sometimes you may not be able to wait until the car slows to a stop. For instance, you might be on a steep hill or you might be about to hit something. If you need to slow down in a hurry, look for something on the side of the road to slow you down. For example, try rubbing against a guardrail, scrubbing your tires against the curb, or driving through bushes. If there's no way to stop in time, look for an escape path. It's better to go off the road and damage property than to hit a moving car or pedestrian. When you finally come to a stop, make sure the car is off the roadway. Stopping in traffic might cause an accident. After the car has stopped, call for help. Don't try to drive the car to a garage. Sometimes a car will stall as you slow down to go around a corner. If you have power steering and power brakes, the car may be hard to control. If this happens, pull extra hard on the wheel with both hands to make sure you get around the corner. Stop the car pushing extra hard if your car is equipped with power brakes. It can be real scary if the headlights suddenly go out while you're driving. If this happens, try the dimmer switch. That will often restore them. Try the headlight switch a few times. If that doesn't work, put on the parking lights, emergency flashers, or turn signals. Anything to get a little extra light. Pull off the road as quickly as possible and leave the emergency flashers on. If your gas pedal sticks, keep your eyes on the road. Quickly shift to neutral. Pull off the road as soon as you can. As you bring your car to a stop, turn off the engine. If your hood flies open, slow down. Try to look through the space between the hood and the body to see the road ahead. If you can't, put your head out the window and look forward around the side of the hood. Use the center line or lane marking as a guide. In any case, brake and pull off the road as quickly as you can. Having your car stall is not an emergency, except on a railroad track. Should this ever happen, and you see or hear any sign of a train, get out of the car and get as far away from the tracks as you can. People are killed every year because they try to save the car and run out of time to save themselves. Accident procedures. Even the best drivers occasionally have accidents. If you are in an accident, stop your car at or near the accident scene. Stay there until the police have arrived and questioned everyone involved. If you can, move your car off the road so you don't block traffic. Find out if anyone is hurt if someone is hurt, help them as best you can and call for an ambulance. 
do not move an injured person unless there is danger of another accident. Get the names and addresses of everyone involved in the accident and any witnesses. Be sure to get the names and addresses of anyone who is hurt. Be sure to get the other driver's name and address. Make sure the name the driver gives you matches the one on the license. The driver's license number, car registration number, make, model, and year of car, license plate number, and insurance company name. Be sure to note any damage to the other car. Always call the police if there is an injury or death, or if a car or other property is damaged. The law requires you to inform the police about an accident right after it happens. Should the accident involve a parked car, try to find... Notify your own insurance company at once. Give complete information about the accident. ABC Driving School, 602-272-1908, ABC Driving School. Being in shape to drive. To react quickly and skillfully in emergencies, such as the ones we've just described, you need to be in good shape. That's the topic of this last section of the video. Drinking and driving. Being in shape means being sober. Alcohol is this country's number one killer. Over half of all fatal highway crashes involve drinking and driving. In a typical year, that adds up to about 25,000 people. That's more than the entire population of Prescott, Arizona. Anyone who drives after drinking should know the following laws. If you hold an Arizona driver's license, you must take a breath, blood, or urine test if police ever suspect that you have been driving under the influence of alcohol or other drugs. If you take a breath, blood, or urine test and fail it, you can be charged with driving under the influence of alcohol. Even if you pass the test, you may still be considered to be driving under the influence if there is evidence that you've had enough alcohol to affect your ability to drive safely. If you refuse to take a breath, blood, or urine test, the Motor Vehicle Division will automatically suspend your license for one year. If you go to court for a first offense and are convicted of driving under the influence, you can be sentenced to at least 24 continuous hours in jail, fined at least $250, and have your license suspended for three months. To understand why the law is so tough, it helps to know why alcohol makes driving so dangerous. When you drink, alcohol goes to your stomach, where it is absorbed into the bloodstream. The blood brings it to your brain. Once in the brain, alcohol affects driving in three ways. One of the earliest effects of alcohol is to harm your judgment. Your ability to make good decisions gets worse. When that happens, you're more apt to take risks. You may drive too fast or be less alert. Worst of all, you don't have the judgment to realize that alcohol has affected your driving. Second, Alcohol affects your coordination, your ability to handle a car. Unfortunately, by the time your coordination and skills are gone, your judgment is already too far gone to recognize alcohol's effects. You probably think you're doing great. And third, if you drink enough, alcohol will eventually affect your vision. You won't see things clearly. Because most drinking is done at night when good vision is most important, vision loss is very dangerous. Under the influence of alcohol, dimly lit shapes become confusing. It's hard to see parked cars and turns in the road. You become blinded by the lights of oncoming cars more easily. A good way to help you judge whether you are safe to drive is to know how much alcohol is in your system. There's an easy way to figure this out. First, count the number of drinks you've had. By a drink, we mean a 12-ounce bottle or can of beer, a regular size glass of wine, or a mixed drink containing one shot of liquor. These all have about the same amount of alcohol. Second, 
To figure out how many drinks are still in your system, subtract one drink for every hour that's passed since you started drinking. This is because your body can burn off about one drink an hour. For example, if you started drinking two hours ago and had five drinks in that time, the number of drinks in your system would be the five drinks you've had minus two drinks that your body has burned off since you've started drinking equals three drinks still in your system. This shows that how fast or slow you drink is just as important as how much you drink. Let's say that you've been at a party for three hours and in that time you've had eight drinks. How many drinks would you have in your system? After eight drinks over three hours, you would have about five drinks left in your system. If you are a person of average size, five drinks in your system is enough to put you over the legal limit. If you were caught driving with this much alcohol in your system, you would be charged with driving under the influence. Drivers who weigh less than average or who have less drinking experience can become unsafe or illegal with even fewer drinks. Many people believe that they can sober up by drinking coffee, taking a cold shower, or getting exercise or fresh air. The fact is, there is no way to help someone sober up fast. Only time can sober up a person who's been drinking. Here are a few suggestions to help you avoid driving under the influence. If you plan to drink, set a limit on the number of drinks you will have and stick to that limit. Don't change your mind just because you don't feel drunk when you reach your limit. Remember, after one or two drinks, people lose the good judgment to tell what kind of condition they're in. Sometimes it's easier to limit the amount of alcohol in each drink than to limit the number of drinks. Before you reach your limit, begin mixing your drinks weaker and weaker. This way, you can taper off gradually rather than have to suddenly stop drinking. Another way to limit your drinking is to make every other drink a non-alcoholic one. Some people will hold on to a drink all night, constantly taking sips and getting a new one as soon as the old one is drained. But by alternating alcoholic drinks with non-alcoholic drinks or freshening drinks with straight mixer, you lower your chances of accidentally getting smashed. Getting involved in activities such as dancing or games will give you something to do with your hands besides hold on to a drink. It will also make you less likely to drink just because you're bored. Food also helps prevent intoxication. Eating gives you something else to do besides drink. And it also slows the rate at which alcohol enters your system. A good way to keep from driving under the influence is to let somebody else do the driving. People who go to parties can ride together. Just make sure the one who does the driving agrees not to drink. If there is no one else to share the driving, call a taxi cab. Other Drugs and Driving There are many drugs other than alcohol that also affect your mind and your physical abilities. They also, therefore, affect your ability to drive. When using any drug, even... ABC Driving School, 602-272-1908. Phoenix, Arizona, ABC Driving School. ...medicines, such as throat lozenges, cough and cold remedies, and allergy medicine. Before taking these drugs, find out how they may affect your alertness and, therefore, your ability to drive well. Prescription drugs can also influence your ability to drive. Before taking any prescription drug, make sure you know how much you're supposed to take, how often, and what possible side effects to expect. Illegal drugs, such as marijuana or cocaine, contribute to many traffic accidents. Research has shown that all illegal drugs in some way make it harder to drive safely. Any drug that changes your judgment, perception, or alertness poses a risk when driving. And remember, driving under the influence of illegal drugs isn't just unsafe, it's illegal. The combination of illegal, legal, or even over-the-counter drugs with alcohol can be dangerous and unpredictable. 
don't drink after taking medicine, especially if you know you will be driving. Driving and fatigue. Lots of people have heard about accidents that happened when someone fell asleep at the wheel. Even if you never actually do fall asleep at the wheel, your chances of having an accident are greater if your alertness and reactions are dulled because you're tired. Here are a few tips to help you fight fatigue. Begin long trips in the morning, preferably before morning traffic begins. If you leave later in the day, you'll lose the daylight hours when driving is safest. Also, by starting fresh, you will be able to drive longer before you get tired. Schedule stops in advance. Decide ahead of time what is a reasonable distance to drive in one day. Find a place to stay and call ahead for a reservation. To help keep from getting tired on the road, you should stop at least once every two or three hours to take a break. Rotate drivers every few hours to help keep drivers from getting tired, and avoid driving more than eight hours a day. Stop before evening rush hour traffic. Avoid driving at dusk or in darkness, the most dangerous and tiring times to drive. Once you begin feeling tired, the only thing that can help is sleep. At the first sign of drowsiness, start looking for a safe place to pull over and stop. Remember, the alternative could be falling asleep at the wheel. Driving and emotions. Many drivers let their feelings affect how they drive. This is dangerous because you may not always be able to control your emotions. At least try to understand the effect your feelings may have on your driving. Then take steps to see that they don't make you a dangerous driver. For example, if you are often impatient or always in a hurry, try to allow extra time to get places. Leave five or ten minutes early. If you get angry, try to work off your anger before you get behind the wheel. If you've got a lot on your mind, try not to think about your problems when you're on the road. Safety restraints. Of all the things that you can do to protect yourself when you drive, the best thing is to wear your safety belt. Here's why. If you get in an accident, safety belts help keep you inside the car. People are not better off if they are thrown clear of the car. Studies show your chances of living through a crash are about five times greater if you stay inside the car. At the time of impact, safety belts will help keep you from being thrown against hard surfaces, such as the steering wheel. When your car stops suddenly, everything in your car that is not tied down keeps traveling at the same speed until it hits something. If your car stops suddenly at 30 miles an hour and you are not wearing a belt, you will hit the steering wheel, windshield, or dashboard at 30 miles an hour. Many people mistakenly believe that at 30 miles an hour they could brace themselves to prevent injury in an accident. To understand what this is like, imagine riding a bicycle as fast as you can into a brick wall. Could you brace yourself? Safety belts help you keep control of your car. If you have to steer quickly in an emergency or if your car is struck from the side, your body will tend to slide across the car. It is almost impossible to control the car if you're struggling just to stay behind the wheel. For this reason, safety belts can actually prevent further damage after the first collision. Some people are afraid safety belts will trap them in a burning or sinking car. The fact is, cars hardly ever burn or sink in a crash. Even in the unlikely event that you are in this type of accident, you will be better off belted to your seat. Safety belts help keep you from being knocked unconscious and you have to be conscious to get out of the car. Safety belts are just as important for children as they are for adults. An approved safety seat is required by Arizona law for any child four years old or less, or weighing 40 pounds or less. Review questions. We will now ask you several review questions. 
All the questions concern information that was presented. This video is yours to keep. Compliments of ABC Driving School. Thank you for considering us for your instructional needs. ABC Driving School, 602-272-1908. You will be able to pass your license test. The questions you are about to see are shown in a way that looks very much like the Arizona video license test. But the questions here are not the same questions that will be on your test. Question 1. If you are driving with an instruction permit, you must have a licensed driver in the front seat with you. You must have a licensed driver somewhere in the vehicle. You do not need to have a licensed driver in the vehicle. Question 2. A yellow stripe in the road separates lanes that go in different directions. Separates lanes that go in the same direction. Indicates you are in a no-passing zone. Question 3. A sign this shape means you are coming to a school crossing, you are coming to a railroad crossing, you are coming to a stop sign. Question 4. This sign means there is an S-curve ahead. There is a steep hill ahead. The road is slippery when wet. Question 5. In city traffic, you should be looking ahead two car lengths, one block, a quarter mile. Question 6. This hand signal means... You will slow or stop. You will make a left turn. You will make a right turn. Question 7. If your car breaks down on the road, you should put out flares as close to your car as possible, at least 50 feet behind your car, at least 200 feet behind your car. Question 8. If you drink six drinks in two hours, how many drinks will be in your system at the end of the second hour? Two drinks? Three drinks? Four drinks? Question nine. Which contains the most alcohol? One shot of liquor? Two regular glasses of wine? Three regular bottles of beer? When you approach a flashing red light, you should maintain speed, slow down, come to a stop, video license test demonstration. If you will be applying for a driver's license and you think you might have a hard time reading a regular written test, you can use the video license test. Here's how it works. When you go to get your license, tell the examiner you want to take the video license test. The examiner will start the test for you. Once the test starts, the testing machine will tell you everything you need to do. When the test starts, a recorded voice will tell you a little bit about the test. Then it will start asking you the questions. After each question, you will see three possible answers. If you've learned the information in this video, you will know which answer is the correct one. The machine will ask the question again. Then you will see the three possible answers again. Each answer will be in a corner of the video screen. Touch the picture that goes with the answer you think is correct. If you're not sure and you want to hear the question again, touch the red arrow in the upper left corner of the screen. The machine will go back and start that question over. You will now see an entire question, just as you would see it on the test screen. Of course, your screen can't tell which picture you've touched, but the test machine can. After you've answered the question, the machine will automatically go on to the next question. The driver of this school bus is required to come to a stop when it comes to a flashing yellow light, when coming to a railroad crossing, when approaching a school zone, 
the driver of this school bus is required to come to a stop when it comes to a flashing yellow light, when coming to a railroad crossing, when approaching a school zone. Touch the answer you have chosen. If you wish to review the question, touch the red arrow. The machine will tell you when the test is over. Then, tell the examiner you are finished. The examiner will tell you whether you passed the test. This concludes the Arizona Video Driver Manual.